Welcome to the Misophonia Podcast. This is Season 7, Episode 21. My name is Adil Ahmad, and I have Misophonia. This week I'm talking to Dan, a visual artist based in Glasgow, Scotland, who works with projected visuals for live performances and installations. Dan's miso actually is a relatively new issue for him, rather than having started at a young age. We talk about coping methods, anger management, getting support from family and friends, and the role of art in mental health. I've got a link to Dan's website in the show notes. Definitely check it out. After the show, please let me know what you think. You can reach out by email at hello at misophoniapodcast.com or hit me up on Instagram or Facebook at Misophonia Podcast. Please head over, leave a quick review or rating wherever you listen to the show, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps us um, get driven up in their algorithms and reach more listeners. A few of my usual announcements. Thanks for the incredible ongoing support of our Patreon supporters. If you feel like contributing, you can read all about the various levels at patreon.com slash misophoniapodcast. And I want to mention... The self-help book Sounds Like Misophonia, which was just released in November, written by Dr. Jane Gregory and I, is um, available now everywhere around the world, online and in stores. Very excited to see that out there. This episode is also sponsored by the personal journaling app that I developed called Basil, B-A-S-A-L. Basil provides AI-powered insights into your journal entries and guides you with new writing prompts based on those insights, and you can explore different therapy approaches and modalities. It's available on iOS and Android. Check the show notes or or go to hellobasil.com. All right, now here's my conversation with Dan. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you here. Yeah, lovely to be here. Thanks very much. Of course. Um, Yeah, do you want to tell the audience kind of where you're located? Uh, yeah, I am in Glasgow, in Scotland, um, although I grew up in Yorkshire, uh, in the north of England, so uh, my my voice, my accent isn't typically Scottish. <laughs> yeah. No worries, no worries. Yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to tell this time. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, actually, yeah, I do want to maybe talk a little bit about what you do over there. Yeah, I, well, moved here uh, to Scotland about 14 years ago to study, and I was studying at the art school, um, an artist, um, and I've predominantly worked in art spaces as a visual artist and periphery roles, um, as well as more recently in the realm of education a little bit as well, so um, it's a really good place for that, and glad to be here in Scotland. That was great, yeah. Yeah, and we were introduced uh, through Ross, who was on the podcast uh, some time ago. Um, yeah. I guess when, when this goes out, it, well, yeah, he was on like early fall 2023. You know, that's great. So he, you know, he's a composer, you're a visual artist. Um, yeah, and he mentioned that, you know, obviously you have misophonia and, um, and yeah, might have some interesting yeah. thoughts. I'm always interested in creative people with misophonia. Um, yeah, I guess maybe do you want to set the landscape as to kind of like, you know, what's going on with you these days? How is misophonia affecting your life? Yeah, thanks. And great nod. Uh, Ross is indeed a, a great composer, a uh, true Scotsman, uh, a yeah. true friend as well. So, um, yeah, it was nice that I was introduced to the podcast through him, but also he uh, mentioned um, about our conversations having been helpful uh learning around mm. misophonia so i'm really glad to have the chance to talk a little bit about um misophonia as i find it's affecting me daily now but in a way that i feel a lot more aware than i have been and um really benefiting from that awareness and i felt having the chance to discuss it with you in this format um, might be a useful way to share with people that I love and I care about it in my life that are also affected by how misophonia affects me. Yeah, that's yeah. that's exactly the point of the podcast, and that's great that if it can kind of these conversations can kind of help whenever these conversations help other people, it's great. So, is it usually? Um, so, I know for I know for for Ross, it's a lot. I remember uh, oh, there's a lot of uh, 
pigeon action in Scotland, which, uh, which is kind of a problem. It's the seagulls, um, the seagulls. Yeah, or seagulls, having... seagulls, <laughs> right, right. Um, so yeah, I mean, daily life for you, is it, um, is it that kind of environmental stuff at home? Um, you're an artist, so I'm, I'm always curious, kind of like, um, are you affected at work? Uh, or, you know, when you're trying to create art? Yeah, it's a really interesting place. Where do I start from? Because I feel like I'm joining a very well-informed conversation that you've built through the podcast. But it's useful to try and think, how is it to describe this to somebody who's never heard the word before? And also to caveat that I'm describing my experience of it. Yeah. So um, it's, for me, I have gone through different stages referring to it as a sound sensitivity um and at times it's most useful to have just the very uh top level what how you might describe to somebody that um being sensitive to sound you'd like to make a change or excuse yourself for acting in a way that they wouldn't expect and um then it's also been a chance to reflect on a journey for me um, I'd sort of highlight over the last four or five years in which I've been a lot more aware and um, then over the last four or five months felt like I've become more informed as well so um, benefiting from that um, yeah that, that development yeah 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 and um, and then I guess maybe kind of like also going back to uh, um Maybe we can go chronologically. I'm kind of curious, where did things start for you? Was it at home? Yeah. Up? Uh, I suppose, well, as I said, over the last sort of four or five years, but um, I would say that time frame around four years ago, just prior to the pandemic as well, um, I became very aware of sensitivity with sound and... Um, built from that actually a bit of a surprise i looked back in my evernote app which i record all sorts of <laughs> notes responses yeah. and i found an earlier mention that i had re- uh, written down the word in 2017 so that was interesting for me in two ways one that i perhaps had um dabbled with it but also whether i'd forgotten it intentionally or been a bit too busy to give it the attention at the time um also it really didn't yeah. um it really it really is pretty recent for me. i must have brain farted and, and just not not uh <laughs> not processed <laughs> that because i just assume it starts so early for everyone so it really um so you so going back to childhood you really don't have any memories of of such a thing well as i think as i said over the last four or five months i'm thinking a lot more how do yeah. I relate to accounts that people share of childhood trauma? And um, I'd say I had a relatively well privileged and happy childhood. Um, yeah. I would allow, though, that it was often turbulent at times. Um, growing up in Yorkshire with my mum and my dad and one sister. Um, mm. And I feel it's pretty safe to share in, in this context that uh, we went through a lot of challenges. It was more for me early teens, and that was around a time when my mum was struggling a lot with depression and mm-hmm. or living with that. And also, my sister was going through a bit of a whirlwind teenage period, and um, it wasn't uncommon as well through that time for my. Uh, parents to or family members to argue so there were mm-hmm. things that I was hiding from and I think I realized in retrospect that how much that conditioned me as a person to whether it was directly towards me or, or sound sensitivity but it definitely has con- conditioned me to be somebody who tries to avoid some conflict or to mm. um, make sure I'm really hesitant to ask ask of anybody um interrupt or change change their habits so um that where you ask about the earlier memories that definitely feels relevant but without feeling like i've pieced it all together yet or, right yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you kind of describe like a walking or an eggshells kind of situation maybe sometimes <laughs> yeah very much so which is um 
it's a great point, Adil, but also it's regrettable that I found in later life that my misophonia has, that's been a consequence that other people have felt like they're a bit on eggshells around me because... Right. Um, I guess to tie it together where I mentioned this first note that I took of misophonia, it was during a period where I'd had quite a lot of change in my life and I went through CBT, which mm -hmm. was... I initiated it really because I wanted to address challenges I had in my temper. And I think at that time, if I took a note of misophonia, I was starting to realize there was lots of factors um, that might cause me to struggle with my temper. And although I was never violent in any way, I was a lot more, um, at that time, uh, com uh, conflict, or what do I mean? Uh, and, uh, willing to argue and I suppose I'd normalised that but the the catalysts for it I was wondering how much it was to do with other factors stress and challenges but then living circumstances and sound uh, on reflection were quite a big factor there uh, yeah that's interesting okay um, yeah obviously like you know feelings of anger are kind of a, a big deal for us and uh Makes sense that yeah. If you well, actually, um, I, did you know what misophonia was as a term around that time when mm. you, when you went in for um, to get you know CBT treatment I don't for think I did. anger? Yeah, okay. um, and I I felt like um, three years on from that when I when I uh, first started to use the term that it was brand new to me, so it was a bit of a surprise that I realised oh, I did take a note of it. I maybe just didn't fully understand what it was. And I suppose that brings us on to something that would feel helpful to share is the journey that a lot of people, I assume, with misophonia go through of different ways of describing it. And I think initially I would use comparisons that are helpful in the short term but actually problematic in the long term as would say it's related the outcome would be to challenges with temper but also um, early comparisons I would make with OCD and that mm. was helpful in the initial term to go okay I am for friends and family to understand what sort of condition or um, uh, yeah what misophonia might be to some degree but yeah, in the longer term, it caused a bit of misunderstanding as well. Yeah, it uh, yeah, like it it definitely gets uh, roped into to OCD, probably because the definition of OCD is uh, usually kind of misunderstood. Um, OCD mm -hmm. is kind of intrusive thoughts when you're not when nothing's really happening necessarily, but misophonia is a response to something. Um, but, but yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And then it, it gets further confused because the, the treatments are so different. The exposure therapy is actually part of uh, OCD treatment. And obviously we wouldn't want to go there for misophonia. Um, but but another thing is, another thing you mentioned is, yeah, before when we don't know what misophonia is, we usually are labeled as uh, by other people, but also ourselves as just kind of irritable, angry people. And, um, and you know, I can see how that could have been a factor for you to, to uh, maybe seek some professional help for just kind of like a uh, like a blanket temper kind of kind of issue um, yeah anger management yeah I think one thing that I also in dad I've learned in experience is that a lot of other factors affect how sensitive I am uh, with misophonia um, or by that I mean if I am at a stressful period in my life then my misophonia will be a, a, yeah. a lot more present and I'll be a lot more sensitive and um, so yeah that then brings the challenge of um, people trying to understand why one situation will be very hard and then months later it's okay that same situation and um, yeah it's a challenge to, to try and explain that but um, it helps lead me towards some of the approaches to overcome it. And um, it's been amazing listening to a lot of other guests on the podcast. Um, 
regularly referring to living situation and moving and uh, I think for me a key catalyst around I recognizing that I have an unusual level of sensitivity was a house move and I could identify how the I had a few flatmates this is going back about four years ago in Glasgow just before the pandemic and there were certain things that I found really triggering that um, felt quite normal, quite understandable. And <laughs> that was a mm -hmm. flatmate playing the banjo at six in the morning or um, slamming doors late at night. And um, yeah, these sorts of intrusions. But then there were other other things that were really, I was very sensitive to that felt very normal. And I recognize that reaction and yeah maybe it's helpful to try and articulate what a reaction is for anybody who hasn't has hasn't felt that um from my perspective a a trigger or uh, action with misophonia is um a sense of panic seems an appropriate word another thing about my living situation right now is that i am an airbnb host and I am living with a situation of a spare room and guests coming regularly. And mm. the right now, I meant to caveat at the start that there were some guests arriving who um, have just arrived and quite possibly them arriving logging onto the Wi-Fi has given us gotcha. a little trick. But also it's, it's a great example of the sort of circumstances <laughs> in things changing uh maybe metaphorically you know that um, yeah it starts to interfere with the the connection but yeah oh that's interesting yeah um yeah meta interesting metaphor there yeah maybe actually i was gonna back up to the reasons you yeah i mean the reasons you went to therapy again were kind of for anger management uh am i is it safe to say like you know um you know, it was, it was, you know, not to get maybe too much of the family stuff, but like you were your, were your like loved ones kind of being kind of the subject of some of your, your, uh, some, some incidents that kind of led you to, to seek help? Yeah. At the time I was living with somebody very briefly and I was quite argumentative and I feel mm. that I recognized that I had normalized that as, um, a normal word output and a normal rhythm. And it was, um, really good to seek out help to change that and really empowering to do that over a period of time and recognize that I went over a year or so from somebody who felt that conflict was normal to somebody who was adverse very much uh, irritated friends and part like partners that I wouldn't argue <laughs> yeah and yeah. um but it, it's very encouraging because I felt um, a recognition of, yes, your upbringing conditions you a lot, but there is potential to overcome it. And that gives me hope in uh, addressing misophonia that while it may have been caused by a lot of events in the past, it is something that I might be able to work with. Um, and in this example, talking and re reframing it mentally, I think was a real help. Um, yeah. Did you find that um, being an artist, that um, you know, finishing pieces of work, or even even you know, you know, the process of creating art, um, would kind of maybe help you calm down, or at least kind of like make you less sensitive? Because um, I, I don't know when I do stuff like that, I I definitely feel a sense of uh, I don't know, so holistic calm or something, where I can kind of like manage through the next you know short period of time. And I just kind of like the, the amplitude of the triggers isn't as great. I'm just curious if, uh, if yeah. art has been kind of a help for you. Yeah, definitely. And having time where it can get stuck into a project. And then you mentioned a sort of sense of completion is euphoric. And it, it does feel like a process and circumstances in which I am able to uh, revel in an environment I create and can control and have often worked in different um, 
circumstances often uh, uh, in the evening uh, and uh, slightly out of the way so that I could enhance that lack of um, distraction, interruption and uh, yeah, really enjoy having that practice. Maybe let's talk about kind of your day-to-day coping mechanisms. Um, are they kind of earplugs, avoidance, kind of curious, kind of like how you muddle through the day? Yeah, certainly. So initially, well, um, I suppose the first key coping mechanism for me was getting some AirPods. And to give you a bit of context, where I found Miss Vinia hardest in my life was during the pandemic. And I had quite a comical situation um, that I, within a few weeks, went to live with my oldest friend, Lewis. And it was really well intended that we would live together, give each other a bit of support. And um, we didn't know as we did how long we would be in lockdown and um, the bigger picture. But I was working at the time, working remotely on computer. That was the first time I stepped into it outside of art in education. So it was quite a desk-based um daily routine which in some ways was welcome and everything else was fluid in the pandemic but this blessing was making uh recording an album as a musician and just the common cool scenario of the two of us in the same house me trying to focus on the um, uh challenging work i was building a chatbot at the time and <laughs> needing needing all the headspace and to control the right. sound well through the wall my friends recording the same riff again and again and singing and um that forced me to quickly learn and find good coping mechanisms and it was a combination of controlling sound in the immediate i got some airpods the airpods pro were a total game changer for me getting noise cancellation and it was funny I remember going I ordered them to collect on my birthday and I was sat outside um, near the shop I would collect them for and I saw a friend walking past uh, across the grass and I shouted Mm -hmm. um, and they totally ignored me but I realized they had (laughs) the airports in as well so I was like, oh, this is a good sign. I'm getting, yeah, <laughs> get, getting uh, a chance to condition or control the world a little. And I think that um, the the best investment for me, and I haven't been without them much since. There was, yeah, a couple of memorable occasions without them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, right. combining that with some other similar uh, earplugs and I actually over the last few months have felt like I really appreciate having a gradient of alternatively having um, sort of the flare model of earpods which are able to just soften and take the top and bottom off a lot of sounds and then loop which are um, and earplugs that adjust to uh, really help to different levels blocking out sound um, and on that initial level, I uh, think that's quite fundamental for me in coping mechanisms. Um, but then that so for thing, you, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, oh, well, just thinking that linked with that is uh, I use AirPods a lot to engage with the Car Map, which is. Uh, are you familiar with the Car Map at all? Uh, no. I, or... I'd say it collects. Maybe a main theory is supporting meditation as a practice, but also I love it ha- supporting nap. Oh, and calm, napping. like the yeah, yeah like the like, <laughs> kind of like headspace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'm familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, for sure. Brilliant. And well, from that, um, supporting controlling sound while sleeping as well, and a really helpful catalyst from that was that they host not quite podcasts, but they call it master classes and one of them which was focused on a book or an overview of a book which was called the depression cure but that book was also introducing a lifestyle or antidepressive lifestyle and it's that it's 
um, approach that whether you're going through a period of challenged mental health or depression in your life or not, these elements that it highlights about your lifestyle, working on them will really help you in any any circumstance. And I found that really did work for me, particularly in that point we talk about controlling the periphery context, um, m- minimizing the times in my life where I did feel hyper or have felt hypersensitive with these things. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about these? You said something about uh, yeah, controlling the periphery sounds um were, were there are there any kind of techniques or mind framing that uh that were particularly helpful well i think for me in run directly controlling the, the sounds but i think controlling the other like certain key elements of your life recognizing mm. that you're getting enough sleep uh, eating yeah, yeah. well um light exposure uh diet and um, social contact and i think these these things do help. And I suppose to summarize it, it's about realizing a certain element of routine really helps me feel mm. comfortable, particularly a morning routine. I love to get up, do a bit of yoga and get a cup of Yorkshire tea. And if I can do that in peace, then I my tolerance for whatever sounds the day is going to throw at me is uh like you know full strength but if i get interrupted in that initial period then i'm hypersensitive it's a real challenge yeah 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 no i can i can totally relate to that um and have you um i guess i mean have you met any other people with misophonia i know you're relatively new (laughs) to the community well, other than Ross, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's been great talking to Ross in person, and I'm really grateful to have met a few other people. Um, mm. I, my partner at the moment is somebody who relates to having misophonia, which is really wonderful how considerate they are. And um, I also had a real pleasant surprise that. I mentioned I am an Airbnb host, which for all having the shared accommodation in the past has been very challenging. Airbnb brings a degree more predictability and control and it shortens whatever um, condition that another person might bring to the sound to a generally a much shorter period of days, a week or so. Um, so the surprise that came out of that was that an Airbnb guest who had also been on your show, Laurel Thompson, who oh. was a little while ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was. Right, great. right. Um, she, she was um, really great to talk to uh, as we got chatting while she was the guest, and she produced his artwork about yeah. her as well. Yeah. So that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I think I met her. I think that's the one I've met, I've met at the uh, one of the Misophonia conventions back in person back in the day. That's wow, what a coincidence! That's great. It was a really good one that steered me on to listening to her podcast and then her conversation with you. It was eye opening in seeing how well, I've talked a little bit about finding other forms of therapy that aren't directly towards Misophonia actually help me with yeah. my journey on Misophonia. Laura had had some experiences and I've enjoyed hearing other people talk about a more direct approach in uh, therapy and that um, then was quite um, heartening that there's some professional direct support out there but also some. yes yeah, some <laughs> uh, also like quite in inspiring hearing her talk uh, about um, how it influenced her creativity and then some ideas she talks about in the therapy discussing colors of sounds which mm-hmm. is new to me but a little bit of chat with ross since and uh, it's definitely something i want to explore more <laughs> yeah like, like synesthesia like seeing or or is it uh I yeah maybe, you know, maybe related to that i guess seeing colors and or thinking but of then, colors what do you think of sounds when I've heard people start to talk about, oh, um, uh, white noise is helpful, or I find brown noise challenging, or yellow yellow noise is different mm. circumstance, and I am really fascinated by that. I suppose 
um, in my creative practice over the last decade, I've steered a lot towards working with projection and making visuals for musicians. Right. So I'm really interested in how I can respond to sound with yeah. a, project, a projector and, and projecting video in that context. Um, interested then to get into maybe the theory of it to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, some of the conversation there. Yeah, that'd be super interesting. Um, uh, I, I mean, actually, speaking of conversation, did, uh, I, I'm just curious, kind of like how this is when it came up with with Laurel. Like, was that uh, were you both trying to avoid making sound to something, or was she, was she, did she just have a T-shirt or something? I'm curious, kind of like how they came up. I think what was really heartening was it was a real genuine kind of organic comment of. I think, I, you know, there was some joke about sound sensitivity and um, uh, Laurel was traveling with a friend, Alan, who was um, just an amazing example of friendship and support in mm -hmm. that she didn't seem to have misophonia herself, but she was really aware, willing to make changes and make jokes about it and I think be both, yeah sympathetic and a super friend and it, it was really heartening to then I think a, a really natural conversation came up briefly of saying how uh, oh I might have asked have you heard of musophonia and they both burst out oh, laughing because it's yeah, a big yeah. part of their life or it was it was felt like right. that sort of situation yeah that's super cool that's super cool um so yeah. maybe about your um family members do you um or you, friends like have you have you noticed you know even not family members but people close to you has it um you know created any kind of rifts or wedges in, in relationships and kind of maybe i don't know pushed you apart yeah Pretty sensitive I think, issue i know but uh. um i think it was particularly hard in um the situation with my friend living with lewis during the pandemic and he's uh really understanding but it it, it's a helpful thing to explain how I'm sure a lot of people relate with misophonia. It's very hard to explain what you're going through at a time when you're feeling very stressed. In the moment? Triggered. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the worst time to explain it, yeah. <laughs> and so I feel like when you ask about examples of it causing rifts with friends and loved ones, then a, a lot of it has come from that initial frustration or uh inability to explain and that's probably what inspired me towards a conversation where uh could try and articulate a little bit while i'm much calmer how how i see a trigger and reaction but the the patience of friends and family members has, has been um really happening in time i think following uh good nine six, eight, seven, eight, nine months living with Lewis, I was really needing a break. I was uh, finding I was quite stressed all the time, expecting something to trigger me, and it was good for him to have a break. So I went to spend a few weeks with my parents, which, having not lived with them for a long time, a decade or so, I knew was potentially going to be more triggering, more challenging, uh, going into the house where I'd grown up and knowing that they were also nine months into a pandemic. And so it was on one level just trying to be safe about any COVID circumstances. But I remember sitting with them and trying to, trying to for the first time say, oh, so I know it's been really normal that I'll come and stay for a few days or a few weeks, but this time there's a new element. <laughs> it's really present. And initially, using these sort of terms of sound sensitivity and a bit like OCD and bless my parents with, you know, all so well intended, they were apologizing for things being physically a, a bit untidy or certain other elements. And I, I had to try and find calmer ways to say, um, these sorts of points like how I am, struggling with sound coming through the walls and I'm needing to control a little bit more uh, environment and have some more boundaries and have the morning routine 
and it's been a few years since and I've tried to take steps take steps forward to explaining to them how much misophonia affects me because I would say it is on a daily uh, it informs my daily routine and well I feel quite happy to have found ways of coping with it it definitely has limited some times that I've spent with friends and family members as I've become more aware and try and avoid being in any stressful situations both for me but also for them I don't like being somebody who is um, triggered shutting down a little bit um, and it's really been a case of taking it little steps at a time so the first time that I felt I'm going to wear earplugs and will eat in the same room but it's it's going to be uh, for me at arm's length or I suppose having realised that a lot of the triggers that I have with Miss Venue are quite common for other people um, interested in working out how is a healthy way of sharing that or explaining that and um, yeah I don't think there's a necessarily a fast track but I, I do think yeah that, that gaining some awareness we could we could start to have a wider um, awareness that would would really help uh, people, especially in a family dynamic. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, do you, did you say you had siblings as well? I have one sister. And okay. Yeah, we grew up together, but we haven't lived together for a very long time uh, as well. I've been in Scotland for the last 14 years. She's often been abroad as well. Um, yeah, but I... Was she Don't, like a? I'm curious, kind of like how that relationship was. But did she know about your misophonia? Oh, well, I mean, she, I mean, she, you didn't really have it much growing up. But like, uh, you know, I don't know. Does she, mm. Doesn't sound like she has misophonia. But I'm curious, kind of what she thinks uh, about about all this. We have have been close recently and talked, and she's really good listener and good at understanding. And I think that she can relate in different. Um, elements that uh, she knows it's important to be heard and I think well she has never said that she relates directly as having misphonia I think she's got the understanding of I know what environment we grew up in and what was great about it and what was challenging and mm. seeing just she's I suppose the only other person that can fully relate to to some of that um but yeah, the way that we've talked, it's been really helpful. And to what degree I need them to understand. For my sister, I feel a little bit less than my parents because I rarely sort of go to stay with her. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, it's yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, and I'm curious. Yeah, you're you're talking about um, yeah, boy, you know, wanting to. Uh, you know the need the need for more awareness um about misophonia to help in find family dynamics and beyond I mean, actually I'm, I'm curious kind of like uh have you thought about um i don't know, I don't know where, what kind of projects you're working on now i'm just curious if you've thought about how you know different ways to incorporate misophonia into artwork or or use art as a way to uh um teach the world or teach you know teach a little about misophonia or um, what I'm actually more interested in is uh, is um, how to teach misophones more about um, you know, the complexity of it, or just how we're not alone. Um, the different layer, the, you know, the different emotional layers that uh, that we're all aware of, uh, but mo most of the people it takes you know much. It's much harder to to explain to them. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just curious, kind of, if you've thought about how to use art to kind of like um, express misophonia. Yeah, I'm really interested in my main passion being working with moving image and film. Yeah. And I recognised earlier this year you were um, sharing that there was a film made. So I'm really interested to see that and to see other people's uh, inspiration. There's been a number of short films. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think okay. you're following my my Instagram, but there's been a, there yeah. was like a a puppet short film. There's been. Uh, uh, there's been there's, there's one from Iran which had no words, but it's more kind of like a musical. It's kind of really interesting. Mm. Um, there's one out of Canada that's in a bunch of film festivals. Um, 
and there's more there's more being made actually it's interesting but um Good. yeah yeah i think we need big advocate of uh the power of film to create space for people to reflect and connect and i think for me that's an aspiration i um making short film and that's hinting more at our relationship with technology and how that affects our mental health but i uh by the time to d directly address misophonia i think in that's talking in the context of short film screen based but also i'm fascinated having a practice that a lot of my work has been events and live shows and being responsive to sounds in a visual way and i think that there's something quite exciting to explore there like the potential of how we put um in our human nature we synchronize a lot of what we see and i'm thinking how oh, one of my favorite music videos is the chemical brothers star guitar it's well worth seeing it's a vision out of a train traveling through the countryside and whatever you hear is represented by something you see for every um symbol there's a lamppost for example and yeah the horizon reflects like uh the crescendos and i think where i've steered over the last few years is more to working in that less music videos directly but djing so the live responses responses to sound mm. and um really excited to build on that and to create environments i think that could also visualize how it feels sometimes to have misophonia as um being triggered for me it's not necessarily uh experience that is cognitive it seems something a lot more reactive it's absolutely talk yeah. about yeah the sense of uh uh a trigger cutting straight through your mind and triggering your fight and flight and i think that the sort of live responsive element in uh bj context is a way to start communicating that as well yeah no you're right it's, it seems to be more connected to that the older reptilian limbic system more of a fear response um yeah no that's very interesting and and so yeah something, something else you said about uh yeah, i would definitely want to check out that video i don't i don't know if i've seen a chemical brothers video since block rock and beats but uh, <laughs> i should definitely check i don't want to check that that new one out because i you know i've been reading and just thinking a lot about how it seems like we're i don't know less connected to our uh, our senses organically and whether that has some to technology and 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 marketing and and we're you know we're kind of like we're a very visual society and, and um and uh, you know it's you know like kind of like how we have uh you know highly processed food or, or the, the 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 stimulation that we receive is tends to a lot of times tends to be very kind of pre prepackaged and processed uh, I don't know. It doesn't necessarily. I don't have any scientific basis for this, but it, maybe it's more of a metaphorical or um, artistic thing. But I wonder if, like, our the less time we spend organically engaging with our senses, if that is somehow messing with our ability to filter sounds as danger or not. Yeah, I think that experiences that were to the contrary support that suggestion. So I had an experience of one month being offline it was an artist residency and i found that among other uh, bonuses the um benefits for my uh, sleep and for my focus when i did want to work but also i was a lot less sensitive and i do directly see where uh overstimulation can yeah lead me to being a lot more uh triggered and um yeah linking the two as well <laughs> yeah. yeah no yeah or stimulation yeah actually that's a good idea i think even people talk about like um internet fasts but uh but yeah i, I think i think there's <laughs> i finally actually see some merit in that uh, um to maybe to maybe do something like that and it's not just i don't think it's just over stimulation i think it's just the the type of stimulation that we get is kind of like you know it's like fast food so you yeah. know, is that really healthy for our senses? Actually, do you want to talk about some of the art that you do now? I, I, th I think I, or I was watching some interviews of, of uh, and, and you, do, you mentioned about how um, you're interested in the kind of the intersection of, uh, I think, tech, 
tech and how uh, uh, especially modern tech um, and yeah. how it kind of affects our thinking and information. Do you want to talk about kind of what you do and not necessarily even related to misophonia? Well, yeah, thanks. I studied art and philosophy and the philosophy side of it. I got really fascinated by thinking about technology and it feels like we're living through such a significant time. I'm 34 now and I've lived through what feels like a real revolution and with that we'll have somewhat privileged but also maybe a sense of responsibility to evaluate how the change in our field of vision, our field of connectedness, our field of empathy is uh, affecting us as people and maybe as a generation we have a chance to compare that to a time before in a way that won't be possible for future younger generations. So. I felt really driven to work with technology as well because where previously and in future love painting but that wasn't the right language so that's what drew me towards working with projection and moving image because that felt the right language to talk about technology and our relationships so at the moment I have combined doing a lot of as I say, visuals for live musicians and also video for uh, um, uh, releases uh, not not in the live context but the project I've been working on for the longest is called Navigating Technologies and it is going to be a film exploring how a metaphor of how we learn to navigate the ocean as Mm -hmm. That was a challenging new space that had a lot of oh, potential, yeah. but also a lot of a lot of danger for how we learn to navigate online space. And um, going to be really bringing that together over the coming months. Um, yeah, looking forward to sharing it and uh, the Outer Hebrides later this year, and then building on it from there into maybe something that will work in a short uh, film uh, film festival context next year. So. Um, yeah, uh, I don't directly see that relating to misophonia as much as uh, definitely a sense of responsibility that art can really help to create space to reflect on how we see the world and how it affects us. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. Where, where's your work uh, usually shown? Is there, uh, if it's projections, obviously it's some usually like um, in an installation somewhere. Is, uh, do you do you? Um, display around Glasgow or around the UK? been fortunate over the last decade to show in lots of different places, countries. At mm -hmm. the moment, it will be, as I say, the next next project will be in an art gallery called Dan Lanter up in uh, Thornaway, which is very far north, remote island, but um, in other Sorry, contexts... I think, you went quite, I think you went quite again just after you said you've been like in a show in a lot of different places. and uh, You were probably listening countries, but we didn't hear it. <laughs> Could, uh -huh. you maybe, uh, you list list those you. places. I want to I hear all those, uh, all those places. Uh, well, I've been very fortunate to show work over the last decade in and around different places in Scotland and in abroad in film festival context. But uh, the next project will be over in the Outer Hebrides, a very far north island, remote island in, in Scotland. And oh. in the past, it's been great to be showing around uh, Scotland or film festivals in England, north of England. Um, um, yeah, looking forward to bringing something that is even more um, accessible as less. Uh, uh, I'm really excited and will pursue the live experience, but also in this day and age where we can connect people best in or widest is online as well. So, um, yeah, we'll continue to share, share work and film in that context in the future. Yeah, very cool. Okay. And, and actually, yeah, that brings me... Um, uh, it makes me think of another question when you're when you're doing shows live do you ever get triggered <laughs> like like you, you know you're trying to i, I guess your, your projections are probably kind of stationary i'm just i'm just curious if you're having to like mm -hmm. uh you know set up your work and then put turn it on and then um <laughs> have to you have to be there and then people are just kind of like coughing well oh while it's funny experiencing your work. well thinking about doing visuals for performances then mm -hmm. i um, using software and the terminology is triggers. So I'm setting up a series of triggers, which when certain things happen, 
and the lights respond, <laughs> the video uh, response, the projector yeah. response. But um, yeah, just playing there with the terminology because for me, I think when I get to share work live, I feel a lot less sensitive. I feel really excited and really um, capable and because I'm bringing a degree of control into what the response is to a sound, then that feels really comfortable. And that's that's almost a clue for me of part of the journey ahead, how to feel like I can live with Miss Svenja in an even more comfortable way would be creating circumstances where I can control the responses more. And, and that's everything from um, having the coping mechanisms myself that I can practically act mm-hmm in earphones or <laughs> I'm laughing at uh, a, a new coping strategy that you remind me of here um, I'm a big fan of coconut oil <laughs> okay okay <laughs> it's for circumstances where you might find uh, doors are squeaky or oh, yeah. something yeah I really recommend it uh, <laughs> I'm a WD-40 guy but coconut oil seems much more environment sustainable <laughs> Yeah, it's it's white and it doesn't smell bad. And anyway, um, yeah, just didn't want to let that miss this conversation. No, it's a great the, tip. I've not, <laughs> I haven't heard of coconut oil as a uh, yeah, that's a great tool because you can get it at the anywhere grocery store. Just run over. Yeah, it's great back, for cooking as well. But... Pour it on your pour it on your door. Pour it on the hinges and or your neighbor's hinges. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll start buying everyone it for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that is um, as a an action that I can do from Field Tree, and as well as the longer game stuff, which is having the really valuable conversations that people feel aware and may be able to adjust if, if they know how to. And um, right. yeah, I think performing live just is an environment that all, almost represents that sort of future ideal scenario where um you know the examples of, of friends that have been so kind and, and understood when I've tried to explain this failure and and sometimes I'm sure other people would relate to this, sometimes the act of the intention of helping, even if the action doesn't directly help, that's really heartening and really r- relaxes me. And so I've been in a recent example my sister came to visit, went with some friends to a cafe and where we they'd sat at a table next to a coffee machine and I found I knew that was gonna make it really hard for me to enjoy having lunch and relaxing. And I, I said, Oh, would you mind if we moved to this other table? And we did. It was not a lot better at the other table, but I really felt grateful for the willingness to and the staff as well. Uh, you know, trying to explain to somebody in a restaurant I'd like to move because of the sound they must think. That's a little bit unusual, but it's really heartening when they're like, okay, we'll, we can give a little bit, even if it didn't directly fix the problem. So I think me then thinking like, okay, I do have some slight control over these circumstances. That's a real help. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's that bit of control. But then what you said earlier too about how if, if somebody at least shows that they're trying somehow that primitive reptilian uh, fear-seeking part of our brain feels less threatened you know what i mean yeah. and so um yeah i mean a lot of research that needs to be done but i feel like these are definitely common um data points that we need to be yeah. looking at yeah um well dan uh, you know we, we're we're uh, you know about an hour into it um yeah this has been this has been great it's uh, it's great uh learning learning about your past and and, and kind of um <laughs> it's funny that you're uh you, you met a past guest and, uh, um, you know, I'm glad that you're, uh, uh, you know, even though you've learned about it late that you're kind of like, uh, addressing it, anything, I don't know, anything else you want to share with people about, um, you know, some insights you've had or, or thoughts mm. on your journey? Well, well, it does feel a real, um, privilege to join in the podcast and the conversation. And we talked about some of the guests, um, your recent, um, discussion with the PhD student in Newcastle was really inspiring and oh, yeah. I'd love to connect right. with um, yeah and also maybe previous to that I guess that made me more aware of um, is the term like kinesthesia uh, 
sort of the visual triggers. Oh, I didn't even I didn't even talk about that. Yeah, mesokinesia, right? The whole visual triggers. Yeah. Yeah, and these things. It's just been so helpful. This sense of community. Um, I think for me, I will try and uh, build towards more awareness. I think um, the way that I can do that best is through creative practice. But I have recently been involved with um, amazing the Scottish Mental Health Arts and Film Festival and mm. um, hoping to keep supporting them wherever I can. And I've seen some great films that they include. And so maybe, yeah, just putting that on people's radar and uh, I'll hopefully share with them some, some work in the future. We can bring that to the Misophonia community. Um, and actually, yeah, just one other <laughs> last thought from... Yeah, yeah, please. Preparing to uh, have this conversation, I was fascinated because I was looking for how a, a gauge on awareness of misophonia, and I googled the is misophonia in the Oxford English Dictionary, but I abbreviated it to OED misophonia, and it responded to me by saying do you mean OCD misophonia? So I was fascinated with the way that even technology is kind of, <laughs> in some ways they're maybe exaggerating the misunderstanding. Um, there's some potential that that could be helpful for some, but challenging for others. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, the interesting situation we're at with uh, technology and kind of how we're, uh, uh, it seems like we're communicating with um, communicating with it more and more but uh, it could lead us astray yeah well cool I mean Dan this is this, this super great uh, yeah I'd love to keep in touch and and, and hear about the, the film festival and, and you know kind of any, any of the work you're doing I'll definitely have um, you know, links to you uh, and your website in, in the show notes um, and I think you have YouTube links as well but um, yeah this yeah. is doing great thank you for coming on and uh, we will We'll definitely love to stay in touch about projects. Yeah, thank you ever so much, Adil. I really appreciate your work and everybody else's sharing in the community. So much appreciated. Thank you again, Dan. Uh, great conversation. And uh, yeah, very much looking forward to um, seeing more of your work. If you like this episode, don't forget to leave a quick review or just hit the five stars wherever you listen to this podcast. You can hit me up by email at hellomisophoniapodcast.com or go to the website, misophoniapodcast.com. It's even easier to send a message on Instagram at misophoniapodcast, follow there on Facebook, and on Twitter at X, it's a misophonia show. Support the show by visiting the Patreon at patreon.com slash misophoniapodcast. The music, as always, is by Moby, and until next week, wishing you peace and quiet. Thank you.